Welcome back to the European VC. This is the second part of our interview with Lara Cool, co-founder of Carbon Equity, the first global alternative climate investment platform. This episode is hot off the press as Lara and her team has just closed their first financing round and in the midst of building their first funder fund, feeder fund. In this part, we dive deep on how Lara evaluates VC managers, looking at things like what's especially important to keep in mind for emerging managers when raising, how to think about governance, team alignment, stock options and carry distributions, what the due diligence process of LPs is like, and what Lara's views on direct investments into management companies are. We hope you're ready, because we'll start out exactly where we left you in the last episode. Lara, maybe this is the perfect segue for us to dive into. So how do you actually evaluate managers? How do you make the decision to go into a fund? Yeah. So let's start there in the very broad perspective saying, (laughs) okay, this guy reaches out. What do you do? (laughs) What are your first thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So starting with the carbon equity perspective, how our process works, Mm -hmm. we actually are very proactive in our own outreach as well. We have looked at pretty much all the deals done last year in climate and identified the investors, but also the syndicates. So who invests with whom to create a shortlist for us because the type of syndicates already tells you a lot about a fund. And that obviously is only funds that are already in existence. eh? So uh, that's an important point to mention. It's experienced GPs would already have a fund and are raising a subsequent fund or potentially raising a subsequent fund. So initially, we only look at a few things to bring them on our shortlist, which is, do they have a climate mission? Are they active in one of the uh, segments that we perceive as most important in relation to decarbonization, so on on emissions? Are they signatories to certain forums that are around uh, impact reporting, et cetera, and responsible investing? And then a little bit around the experience of the fund, but not as much yet in the in the beginning. I need to derail this a bit. Sorry, yeah. Lara, just because you said <laughs> something that's been in my mind for some time now, and I'm happy you brought it up. Recently, I had the experience of having to kind of think about ESGs within the funds in the context of LP conversations and LP negotiations. Yep. And I've ran across this debate <laughs> that I find interesting. I'd love to have your quick take on it. And then we go back to, uh, to what we're talking about, <laughs> which is ESGs versus impact investing. Yeah, yeah. Some argue these are completely different things, completely unrelated. Saying they are the same is not understanding what each one is. Others say, nah, it's the same thing. <laughs> don't worry about it. What are your thoughts and comments around that? I don't think I'll be black or white in this. Uh, this <laughs> You'll be gray, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that purely ESG is, of course, very broad to begin with. Um, it encompasses environmental, social, and your governance. So it's, it's very broad. So when we talk about climate impact investing, we talk about something different than I have an ESG label and I utilize the right principles yeah. in running my business. Especially in VC, there's a need to also understand future impact of certain assets and how material that future impact is going to be. And I think purely working on selecting according to ESG will not be enough to have a selection criteria that also uses materiality on a certain topic, for instance, as a baseline. So I think ESG is an important starting point, but really impact investing, no matter if it's climate or social or healthcare for that matter, it really talks about how do you translate that into your operation and how do you also forecast and select for materiality of impact going forward? You could argue it's a detailing out of your ESG strategy. <laughs> I like that reply. <laughs> I'm glad. Very, I'm glad. very converging. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, Lara, I derailed your oh, thought sorry, process. Fine. You're replying to Andreas on, you know, yeah. okay, a VC reaches out. How do you go about it? And you were talking about yeah. some, some things that you look at, vertical stage alignment also, you know, what are the signatories to? Yeah. Feel free to go on on that thought process. Sorry. I think when initially we add a fund to our, our short list, we make an assessment of, Why would we want to invest? eh? So does it align with our own criteria around climate? Does it align with the industry it works in? Does it align with a certain level of experience? And then we actually shift. And then the perspective becomes, why would we not invest (laughs) in this Mm -hmm. fund? (laughs) And so we do an initial quick scan that talks about the investment strategy, the track records, the team, the team alignment, team incentives experience and and those types of things, the markets, competitive uh, space, uh, the fund uh, acts in. And we then look, are there 
elements in here that require further assessment for us to either mitigate or accept we cannot mitigate, but we can accept the risk, let's say, of that fund. And it could be something in track record yeah, where there's personal fund manager track record, but there's not fund track record. Yeah, so it's the first time fund but it's founded by very experienced fund managers. It could be, yes, it's a first time fund, but they're actually founded by a cornerstone LP or platform that provides them with a certain level of experience or backbone and de-risks. It could be that the fund, fund management is a relatively new team in terms of working together. They did a bunch of new hires, but they do have kind of a strong GP commitment personally into the fund, which kind of locks them in, you know, really incentivizing them to make it a success. So essentially we, and, and we've actually learned a lot of this from our investment advisor, which is a very experienced guy in fund of fund investing from Alp Invest, which is kind of a 40 billion uh, assets under management fund investor. The only thing they do is analyze funds and then make recommendations to invest or not invest obviously very financially driven. So we, we follow that thinking. So finding those key areas that could be flags or issues, and then using reference calls, using conversations with the GP and the team to mitigate those risks or come to terms that they're acceptable enough. I'd like to double down on one of the examples you gave because I've yep. witnessed it <laughs> slash been involved in one of those. Emerging managers, they have individual track records and yep. they've never worked together. Yeah. And they're starting working together. And you gave as an example, you know, high GP commit as, you know, an alignment of incentives and making sure that they're truly motivated. What is there more behind that process of, you know, as someone that's screening GPs or, or funds, VC funds, when you see it, it's a new team, what do you look at and how more than what do you look at? It's how do you go about kind of diligencing that, understanding that relationship, you know, how does it work? Do you have any tips there that we can then engineer into? <laughs> well, it's very difficult, right? Because yeah. it very much relates to how much trust is there between these people? Uh, how do they work together? So if there was, if uh, we, we, for instance, are looking in a few funds that already had a first close, so there's been some collaboration yep. and some impressions from both portfolio companies as well as some of the LPs. Okay. Other parts are just having very detailed interviews with each of the team members on what are your expectations on what each and everyone's role is supposed to be in this group and then confirming that with the other person, right? Do you also view this to be your role? And if there's strong diversions there, that could be an issue, right? Because then, yeah. then you could realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe expectations are not so aligned yeah. in this group. Another one would be, yeah, what, what does the carry uh, table look like? Eh? How is that divided among the team? Is it only going to the few key managers, the key persons, or is there actually a bit of carry for everybody in the team? Eh? There's, there are different models there. Yeah. So those could be things we look at. Or maybe on the different models, because we have VCs there or emerging yeah, managers yeah. looking here. Yeah, maybe yeah. could you juxtapose the different models? Say, why do you prefer one over the other? It may be the obvious open door, but uh, given our <laughs> conversation so far, but alignment mm -hmm. of incentives and not hogging carry uh, into few people in the team is definitely one of those. We also, in our own vision of ownership creates positive engagement also believe that everybody in the company should have a little bit of equity right you see you see actually some countries like israel or and also increasingly in the us where actually everybody has a little bit of equity here in europe you more often see just you know founders and, and key people having equity and the rest not really sometimes it's due to tax reasons but oftentimes it's not and just cultural and i think the same counts for VC funds and fund managers. Yeah. Essentially, you're also a company, you're also an operation. I do want to caution towards not everything is driven by money here. I know I started my <laughs> this podcast <laughs> with saying a lot of uh, capital can be an important driving force, but a lot of the things are also more subtle. How loyal have people been in the past to their previous employers, their previous work environments, previous funds they may have worked at? How did collaboration go there? Are they more the the monkey on the rock, as we would say in the Netherlands, <laughs> or more of a collaborative instinct. Or even if you have one monkey on the rock and then others that are fine with that could also work, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as long as we're clear. 
Lara, I'm very interested because you talked about equity in the management company there. And I really like the model of taking personally, of taking investment into the management company, if there's a good reason for it. Yeah. What are your views on that? And how do you think about it inside carbon equity? Well, we have invested in our management company. <laughs> and you know, carbon equity is, of course, a little bit of a different model in a way that we may seem like a fund manager, but we're also just a tech company and, and mm-hmm. a climate fintech. We obviously like to position ourselves, but hopefully we'll stay true to that mission. So we, we've raised financing into our into our management company. We actually closed yesterday, so it's quite exciting. Uh, waiting for a moment to work this in, so thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Con- and congratulations. Yeah. We should maybe spend some energy on saying congratulations as well. <laughs> it's a huge Thank milestone you. for anyone, so so congratulations, yeah. Laura. Absolutely. Yeah, but and, and, and already, yes, eh, although it is probably not even pre-seed given the stage where we were when we started that race. Uh, we've progressed quite nicely since then, but only close now. So <laughs> now really the acceleration starts. And yeah, and we've already reserved stock options also for everybody we hire for to, uh, to make sure everybody has a bit of ownership in a management company and make sure that they uh, yeah feel like partly owner of carbon equity and of this future success of carbon equity. Yeah. And incentivizing them is important. So how about when a manager comes to you and then tries to raise for his or her fund and then they have an external investor inside their own management company? What are your views? Yeah, so we actually have quite a few of those examples at the moment. And we would really look at how the governance is set up, right? So how are the decision rights uh, arranged for? What is the level of control of the shareholder in the management company? I think it can actually be a good model because it enables you to invest and innovate a little bit on your management company level. I actually wrote this down in one of my notes before this podcast. Topics I'd like to bring up for <laughs> listening ah, to good, good, cool. <laughs> Because what I found striking, and I've definitely also seen this in my experience at Philips uh, Ventures, is that VC and, and private equity, definitely, but definitely also VC, is quite traditional, right, mm-hmm. in their model. Yeah. We haven't seen a whole lot of innovation in the way VC funds are structured and ran in probably decades, if not longer. Yeah. And you know, sure, people are now using tools for deal flow and all that, but you know, not that yeah. innovative. <laughs> yeah, not, and we see, really. you know, <laughs> models we see right now is actually quite a few managers setting up investment companies instead of funds like closed-end traditional 10-year funds. I spoke to climate VCs that were actually planning to do a 15 or even 20-year fund, like have modeled to, to the breakthrough energy of Bill Gates. And because the timelines of some of these deep tech technologies are just much longer for than for traditional yeah, VC. Yeah. But in the end, didn't go forward because the LPs, all the institutionals were like, oh, no, difference. That's not, you know. Yeah, uh, that's a huge problem. That's a huge yeah, problem inside yeah. climate tech. It's, that it's yeah. super yeah. difficult to get into, uh, get the funding instrument working in yeah. the underlying technologies here. Yeah, huge problem. And LPs have a role to play here as well, of course, right? Because as long as institutional LPs have this box they want to tick that it looks like all the previous funds I've invested Mm -hmm. in. Yeah, it becomes very difficult to create more innovative models, uh, right? And we are suffering from the same problem. We're also doing closed-end 10-year feeders. We're doing a closed-end 10-year fund of funds with a management fee and, you know, all that. Exactly. Versus I'd love to do kind of an angel list type rolling evergreen vehicle where you can go in and out and do a subscribe to climate VC investing, right, almost. But you, you actually, you see some funds doing it. And then by the time they want to raise a larger fund, revert back to the old traditional model. Yeah, yeah, and that's because that, that's what the big guys expect. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it's yeah, too bad. Yeah. I can't help but think about what innovation you have seen from managers that you applaud and say, this is ingenious. I'd wish more people would be looking at doing stuff like this inside mm-hmm. the GP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to be honest, not that much. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, it's really a topic on my <laughs> mind uh, for yeah. that reason. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and we are trying to play our own role in that space, right? One of the key elements is the democratization aspect, right? Why can we not have more smaller retail investors participate in VC? It's super exciting. There's an extreme amount of value created already at, at the VC stage. And this whole group of people is just sitting there not able to participate. They can either angel invest or invest when it goes public. But by then, eh, you already have a, lost a lot of value creation along the way. So that's one element. But that's preaching to my own choir a little bit, of course. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
But others are, you know, I, I do find, uh, for instance, such an investment company approach quite interesting, right? Where LPs are not fund investors, but they become shareholders of your investment company. It's in principle an evergreen uh, model. And we know we have seen a few smaller managers also in the Netherlands, for instance, who've done BB Capital as an example. They're more private equity, but they have an evergreen fund model where they are able to accept new investors coming in every six months, I think. You're also able to sell off earlier if need be. And you just continue to grow that pool of capital without having the, yeah, call it exit deadlines that a typical VC has. And yeah, very often uh, may not actually match the value inflection points of the underlying portfolio. And it also makes perfect sense that emerging managers will especially be looking at this type of yeah, vehicle, yeah. right? Because yeah. they are forced to show returns almost within the first four years because otherwise they can't build track record. And yeah, it's yeah. just, and we were talking uh, to Vinith Yayakuma from uh, Draper Spree the other day yeah. also about this, that one of their real competitive edges is that they can play the long game and keep on doing it yeah. because they're IPO'd and that enables them to act almost like Sequoia and, uh, yeah, and, and yeah. A16C who just say to their LPs, yeah, fine, uh, we said 10 years, but uh, we're going to prolong this for six. We're just going to prolong we're... it because yeah. it's better for the portfolio, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be good, that, that type of flexibility and, and enabling that type of flexibility. I think there's a lot to argue in some segments, especially where the, the current model works fine, right? Let's not say it's not working. There's uh, many good things, but it's, it can also be challenging. I mean, it's one thing I liked about us as a corporate venture capital fund at, yeah. at Philip, we're evergreen set up as well, right? And you have a different horizon, which can make you too patient in a sense, but it also in an industry like healthcare, for instance, which is, is just a long game to get into healthcare, especially in, with digital innovation, it helps to have that patience. You were talking about time horizons and, and the lifespan of a fund and so on. I must admit that I'm not that well literate on the counterpart for funds of funds. And so I'm a bit curious of understanding, you know, how does a fund of fund manage that? And the fact that, you know, does it operate the same way? Investment period, divestment period, what are the time spans? What are the standards there? Are there standards, if any, right? <laughs> Could you just guide us through a mini masterclass on that? Yeah, there are, there are a few standards. In principle, one of them is, for instance, you probably need at least six, seven, if you want a really true diversified portfolio, yeah. that you need something like six, seven yeah. funds at least to invest in. You see some smaller fund of funds, but I would put that in a different asset yeah. bucket, essentially. Yeah. So a, a traditional fund to fund, as far as it exists, would typically have about three years of investment period because every additional year extends your horizon beyond the 10, 12, 13, 14 years. It's just a mimicking of the duration of your underlying assets, right? Because you, you can't liquidate before they do. So you're mimicking your underlying timelines and you use the three years to at least have some diversification in, in vintages of the funds. Typically, you'll have already a few commitments and then a blind pool of additional funds based on a certain investment strategy, very similar to a, what, a, what a, yeah. a venture capital fund manager would do yeah. and a pipeline that you may uh, already illustrate. So a typical duration would be, let's say, 12 years with an extension, I mean, 12 to 14 years. And then you just distribute as the underlying funds start to distribute. Eh? So the distribution timelines may be shorter. And oftentimes you also would only see maybe 60, 70% of capital committed actually called because quite early yeah. on, yeah, at a certain point, distribution start to net with the capital calls. Yeah. So if you contribute a million, you may only actually pay in 700,000 or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lara, I'm curious because both you and uh, Jacqueline are uh, very cool persons <laughs> and I hope that you will become beacons in the LP community. But I am curious, to what extent is it possible to become a beacon in the LP community and affect the existing players out there? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, a lot has to do with capital again. Eh? Um, can we raise large enough tickets so that we actually can, yeah, be meaningful in a funds cap table? And therefore, we've had discussions around there, there are some funds that really position themselves as catalyzing capital for climate change and really invest in the unfundable assets, essentially. Mm -hmm. So they invest before the market would, in a way, right? Mm -hmm. There's high technology risk, yeah, well, those types of things. And we'd love to also be able to offer those types of funds and be the catalyzer as an LP in those types of funds. And the same for first-time managers that have a certain climate mission-aligned fund vision that we really believe in. 
So we hope to become large enough and have those billions with our millions of participants mm -hmm. so that we actually can become that catalyzing LP and that people want to get us into their first close. So other people will follow and say, hey, wait a minute, Carbon Equity has invested in this model. It's maybe a non-traditional VC, but apparently they like it. So there must be yeah. something right there, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and help catalyze a little bit of that change in the industry as well. And maybe as a final note, I also think because we speak to so many at, at this point, climate tech VCs, we are learning a lot around how do you select for impact? How do you monitor impact? How do you measure impact? What type of reporting standards are there, which are feasible and which are just over engineering mm -hmm. also. So we hope to develop some insights into best practices on, hey, you guys, this works very well. This doesn't work so well and share that across the different fund managers. So we can also help them improve their own operation, at least initially on the impact side, but maybe other areas as well. Lara, one final question before we let you, of course, say if there's something that you feel that we should touch on. But I would love to hear your views on the GP commit, whether we have some LPs out there saying to a first time fund manager, I want to see you flesh out 10%. <laughs> and then we have others saying that now nah, the GP commit is actually completely unfair structure for something where you have former entrepreneurs who are putting a reputation and personal career and everything on the line when they go out and fundraise. They've already spent one and a half year or two years trying to raise the fund. Don't ask for more. What are your views there? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's one of the criteria we look at and what our investment advisor said, you know, which is actually also typically what we look at in direct investments into portfolio companies. It's good if there's something some type of alignment because there's also upside there, right? So mm -hmm. there's also a benefit to the GP if everything goes well and additional upside for them. But there's no percentage that's right. It's meaningful for the people in the GP, but it doesn't hurt so much that they, you know, have nothing further available for years to come before they get into the money with their portfolio. I don't think that's the right model. So if the right percentage is 0 0.5 or... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm an emerging fund manager in a sense as well. I don't have all that capital laying around to commit to, yeah. uh, you know, I just don't have it. So you not can exactly. ask me to put up that commitment. It's just not there. Yeah. So that, that's a conversation you also need to have. And there's others where you think, hey, a majority owner of this GP is actually a large investment platform. Would make sense if they also put up some capital in there, you know, and, and show their trust in a meaningful way there. So it, it depends also a little bit on who's the GP, what is the GP. If there's already a lot of blood, sweat and tears invested, I would never say no just based on that criteria. No, no. This actually opened up a whole string of questions for me. <laughs> uh, uh, we have some time. <laughs> you are an emerging manager yourself. You've invested for years as a fund of fund manager. So yeah. all the things you've seen emerging managers do, both that are good and that are in incredibly stupid, uh, <laughs> would you touch on some of it? Yeah, I think reflecting on all my experiences also when I was at Philips, so really understand what the type of investor LP is you're speaking with and what drives their decisions. I mean, for Philips as an investor, of course, we would look at some financial criteria and track records and all of that. But in the end, the interest and the rationale was strategic. You know, are you able to find the best medtech, healthcare IT companies Build the right syndicates? Are you connected with the right people? Do you really understand the industry? So your expertise makes sense for us and your market perspective gives Philips the right insights and the right partner versus a purely financial investor where you know they just need to tick certain boxes. <laughs> and Easy walks me into the do not. If you don't tick the box, then don't try the tickets yeah. and spend a lot of time and effort in kind of over-engineering your track record so that somehow, you know, Leave it be for now, maybe do a first close and go back and say, see what happened? They did accept me as an LP, so go talk to them, for instance, because I think you can waste a lot of time with semi-institutional or institutional investors where if you just don't fit the criteria, don't go there. Yeah, yeah. Even more so for a direct investments into startups, even more so here, it's also about the team and the trusted relationship that you hope to build. and. If at some point that trust is broken somehow or damaged, yeah. it'll be very hard to convince an investor to commit. Speaking of unwarranted box ticking, I'm sure that at Carbon Equity, you're seeing a lot of greenwashing. <laughs> yes, but also we also actually see a lot of funds that do more than they realize already align with impact investing, as we would call it. So they have actually mm -hmm. 
certain procedures in place that for them seem almost natural, that for us are actually, hey, wait a minute, this is the type of things we would like to see in order to trust that you are in, in climate impact driven funds. What is also helpful and what I've learned is actually, um, so the, the European Union, of course, has been working on the EU taxonomy and the SFDR regulation to uh, sort of create criteria of what makes an investment asset green. And that had actually helped to remove some of the greenwashing because mm -hmm. now if you go shout out, I'm green, you yeah. have a whole, all these reporting requirements for the SFDR. So I've actually seen legal teams advise funds that are greenwashing essentially to walk away from that because you open up this whole box of requirements that you need to comply with. Yeah. So only yeah. if you're truly committed to the mission, you'll, you'll go there. So it, in a sense, that, that has helped as well. Yeah. And main criteria isn't... Uh... It's not often mm -hmm. that we hear a European regulation as a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> true. Sorry, true. Andrea, yeah. just a side note. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was about to make a ridiculous comment about having a green leaf on your pitch deck isn't one of the things that is in that uh, regulation. There, there's one discussion we've been having. So the European Investment Fund is obviously the largest LP in Europe. They have this climate bucket where they say, if you want capital from the climate bucket, you need to partly align your carry with impact criteria. But they don't tell you how. And we're actually a little bit ambivalent about this whole thing because... And not to immediately give an EU example where it didn't go so well, but because, you know, it could actually create an incentive to under commit to certain that to lower the KPI targets for certain impact measures mm -hmm. because your carry is tied to it and rather under commit overperform than the other way around and therefore miss out on the carry. So the way you structure that is actually quite important for it to be a convincing method of avoiding greenwashing and aligning incentives. Before we round this off, and I'll have to improvise it because Andrea just messed up the next segue. <laughs> but <laughs> is there is there any topic that we didn't touch that you thought would be interesting? Oh, actually, I think we've been uh, quite comprehensive. Quite diligent. I feel like I did talk <laughs> a lot, so I covered a lot of <laughs> Nah, it was great. It was perfect. So, Laura, <laughs> we always end with a quick fire round. Yeah. And fortunately or unfortunately, we had three quick fire questions. We talked about two already. <laughs> and and the quick fire round dynamic is that we ask you a quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds. So yeah. instead of doing that, <laughs> let's use the third one and open it a bit more. And the third and last question is what's next for Lara Cool and Carbon Equity? And let's give you enough time to talk us a bit about, okay, what's the vision? What's coming in the next three years so people can get excited and people outside yeah. of Netherlands can know what to do and when they can approach carbon equity to start investing in VC as an asset class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, happy to talk about that. This mission of getting more capital to solve climate change and build the solutions for our sustainable, future, beautiful world is a 30 year mission for me, but also for Jacqueline and the team. You know, this is what I want to do for the foreseeable or unforeseeable future. <laughs> so that's what's next for Lara. That's what I'll be doing. That you will see what you'll see me doing in my career. And for carbon equity, you know, we're just about to put our first product in the market. So that will be a very important milestone to get the machine going. And by the end of this year, we're hoping to start opening up that fund of funds and with a partner also get the license to be able to market that at least in Europe to get a European passport. So make sure that Everybody in Europe, at least, can participate in our fund of funds. The ticket size would then also be smaller than the 100,000 we talked about at the beginning. So we're looking to lower that to 50,000, but hopefully over time, even to 10,000. And thereby opening this up for a completely different group, eh, where the initial uh, second segue would be the affluent, what we call the mass affluent, essentially, which is a group that has like 300K to 3 million in investable assets. So those could either accommodate the 50 to 100K tickets. But then you want to go to the professionals, right? Just the, the corporate professional, the ones that get their banking bonus, the ones that have sold their company, want to build a new one, but have some excess capital. And you want to provide those people the opportunity to come in as well. Of course, their education, the positioning of carbon equity and the product becomes very important. Liquidity becomes important. Uh, but in the next three years, we want to hack that, those areas to ensure that we create this, this modular investment platform that's also for that audience attractive to make climate investments and to really kind of fulfill that anxiety you're feeling with people where they're saying, okay, 
I'm doing something in my personal life. I actually installed solar panels on my roof yesterday. So, uh, <laughs> you know, making those small steps. <laughs> but it just doesn't feel like enough, right? It feels like the little drop on a, a very hot plate to uh, mm -hmm. be very literal. Yeah. So we want to be able to offer you that opportunity to participate in a more meaningful way. And next year, hopefully that's a few hundred people with 15 million assets under management. In a few years time, it'll be a few hundred million but in the end, it should be hundreds of thousands or even million people participating with billions of dollars or euros. I should say in this mm -hmm. forum, euros. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we are committing to climate and to curated climate investments. That's that's where we want to go. That's that's the mission. And that doesn't stop at Europe. Eh? And yeah, we think there's a massive opportunity. Asia Pacific, US, of course, provides a very interesting opportunity as well. Yeah. So we won't stop at our beautiful union. <laughs> Laura, if I am listening in and I feel that I am one of those kind of personas that you spoke about, whether that's yeah. the affluent in the shorter term or the professionals in the midterm, what should yeah. I do? Do you have a waiting list? Should I reach out to you directly? Should I visit Carbon Equity's website? We do, what should I do? We do. I shouldn't pressure Jeff for uh, <laughs> too much right now in our team working on a revamped uh, website, but already you can sign up at carbonequity.com. You can already sign up to our waiting list where we'll reach out, provide more information and keep you up to date on products coming on the market. And if you're eligible or not to be able to invest in those in a week or so or two weeks, we'll be launching also a new website with a more extensive sign-up form where you can also actually see the products that are being marketed at the moment. Definitely sign up. Come join us, I would say. How about the emerging managers? Where should they uh, sign up? <laughs> Email me at laracool at carbonequity.com and I'll that's follow it. up. That's, uh, that's, it. that's my pipeline. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Reply is, is promised. That's awesome. Thank you, Lara. You were super generous with your time. We appreciate that. And hopefully we'll be in touch and we'll try and stay up to date with all the developments on carbon equity and try and be a megaphone of resharing all of your accomplishments and milestones. Thank you. Much appreciated. Very much uh, enjoyed this conversation. So uh, glad we finally got to it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode with Lara Cool, co-founder of Carbon Equity. If you'd like to see more from Lara, do follow her on LinkedIn and check out the movement that she's starting with Carbon Equity. The European VC is your go-to podcast for insights into European VC. Please do follow us at theeuropeanvc.com or whichever podcast platform you prefer. If you'd like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, please do reach out to us. Next week's episode is going to be with Cyrus Shea, managing partner at Briegel Milestone, a 500 million euro growth fund investing all across Europe. Europe. Let's hear a short teaser. By the time these companies get to growth stage, they have to fight. They have access to about one quarter of the capital that their US peers have access to. So what we've done with Bergal Milestone is we've created a European champion to back these companies and support them as a value-added partner. We've deployed about three quarters of our fund one of about 500 million euros. We've realized two exits. We have generated some great returns for our investors. We're in the top 5% globally for growth funds in terms of DPI distributions paid in capital. We've made nine investments and our platform investments, nine add-on investments as well. So 18 total deals in the last few years. Hope you're as excited as we are. And please do remember, if you're looking to raise an international round and need an intro into international VCs investing in Europe, do reach out to us. We're always there for you.